This year has been kind of crazy for retro console mods. It seems like every time I upload a video, the mods are already out of stock and you guys can't even follow along with me. However, there is an exciting mod that you can do yourself without having to wait for a kit to be in stock. The GBA HD is an open source project that allows you to take a Game Boy Advance or Game Boy Advance SP and turn it into a console that you can use on your TV, similar to the Game Boy Advance consoleizer. The one big benefit of the GBA HD over the consoleizer is that it uses a newer FPGA. There's even an experimental 1080p firmware for this GBA HD, whereas the consoleizer only outputs 720p. In this video, I'm gonna take you through every step of completing this project from start to finish. I do wanna be upfront and say that at the time most of this video was recorded, one of the main components of this build, this shield developed by ManCloud, was not available from any mod sellers. So the majority of this video is gonna be showing you how to put one of these together yourself from ordering this board on Oshpark and hand soldering all the components onto it. The first time that I got my GBA HD all put together, I was having some problems with the buttons being really laggy like one or two seconds latency. The problem was with the shield that I hand soldered, most likely to do with a fake microcontroller that I ordered. I wanna give a big shout out to Retro Upgrades that actually created a batch of these shields and they sent me one. With the shield that they sent me, I was able to finish my GBHD and that latency was gone. With that being said, let's jump over to the bench and I'll show you what this mod is all about. For my GBHD build, I'm gonna use this old Game Boy Advance SP that I have lying around. The Spartan FPGA board is really the heart of the GBA HD, and in order to make hooking it up to the Game Boy a little easier, ManCloud has developed a shield that goes on top of this FPGA board. If you don't know what a shield is, this Spartan FPGA board is kind of similar to the shape of an Arduino. The Arduino has these headers on either side of it here and there, and a shield is designed to sort of stack into those headers just like this, so that you can add additional functionality to an Arduino. This shield from ManCloud does the same thing for this Spartan FPGA board. This GBA HD shield is is not readily available. I had to order this PCB from Oshpark and I have a whole bunch of components off screen up here that we're gonna have to solder to it in order for us to move forward with assembling our GBA HD. I'll leave a link in the description to the GitHub page for this shield, which contains the Oshpark files, as well as the bill of materials for all the components you're gonna need to populate this board. Probably the hardest part of assembling this GBA HD shield is gonna be these flat flex connectors. Before I solder any of the smaller components up here, let's worry about soldering those four FFCs to these four parts of the shield. The nice part about these FFCs is that they're all different sizes, so you shouldn't have to be worried about putting the wrong FFC in the wrong place on the shield. Let's turn this shield around and we're going to start working on this small FFC up here. The way that I'm going to be soldering these flat flex connectors is going to be kind of similar to soldering a ribbon cable. So I'm going to be using my J-tip on my soldering iron and I'm going to do a little bit of drag soldering across the pins here to solder this flat flex connector. The first thing I'm going to do is add some flux down here. And then I'm gonna line the flat flex connector up with the pads on the shield. Getting the pins on the flat flex connector lined up with the pads is crucial, or otherwise, when you go to drag solder, these pins are gonna be not lined up and you might have some bridges. Next, I'm gonna put a tiny amount of solder on my soldering iron and then tack it down with the solder from my soldering iron. So now that it's tacked down on one side, this is the point where you can still move the FFC around if you heat up that solder blob. So you could further tweak the pins to get them over the pads. If we're happy with that, let's go ahead and add more flux to the other side. And since I already have a little bit of solder on my soldering iron, I'm gonna do the same thing on the opposite end. With both ends tacked down, we'll add a little bit more flux, a tiny bit more solder, and we can go ahead and do a little bit of drag soldering on these pins here. If you have a little bit of bridging like I do, you could try to use the iron to drag the solder out of those bridges and more evenly distribute them to the other pins. And in my case, it looks like I have a bigger bridge, so I'm gonna use a little bit of this solder braid.
Okay, that looks pretty good. Let's go ahead and try to clean it up with some alcohol and see what it looks like. Mine came out something like this. I don't see any bridges, so I think we can move on. We still have to solder the ground pads on each side of the FFC, so I'm gonna go ahead and do that now. With this first connector out of the way, I'm gonna go ahead and repeat the same steps on the other three. Now that I have all my FFCs installed, it's time to move on to some of the components over here. And I also added a little FFC to this little quick solder board that we're gonna use for the Game Boy Advance SP. I think it's a good idea to get the really tiny components out of the way first. I'm gonna follow the bill of materials to populate all of these resistors and capacitors here. I'll show you how to solder one of the resistors and capacitors so that way you can know my technique for soldering surface mount components. I'm gonna start with R1 right here and that's a 2.2K 0805 size resistor. The first step is to get solder on one of the two resistor pads. And then I'm gonna grab the resistor with my tweezers here. Put the resistor as flat on the board as I can get it. And then I'm gonna heat up that solder that I placed already and carefully slide the resistor into it. And you're trying to make sure that the other end of that resistor is lined up on the other pad. And if it is, we can turn the board around and then solder the second pad of the board. I'm gonna repeat the same steps for all of those surface mount resistors and capacitors. With all the surface mount resistors and capacitors all set, it's time to start soldering some of the bigger surface mount components. Some of these components might still be in a tight spot, so we're gonna to need to switch our tip to more of like a chisel style tip. But before we do that, let's finish off the components that are gonna need our J tip before we put it away. I think the perfect candidate for that will be the microcontroller. On the shield, you'll see a dot in one of the corners of where the microcontroller goes. There's also a dot in one of the corners on the microcontroller itself, so we're gonna line these two things up. This is going to be a little bit more difficult than the FFCs just because we have to line it up on all sides. Let's go ahead and add some flux to one of the corners, grab a little bit of solder, and with the microcontroller lined up we're going to tack down one of the corners. Let's turn it around and tack this other side. Same thing, add a little bit of flux, double check that the pins are lined up, and then tack the corner. From here on out you can just go ahead and solder the remaining legs. And there's the microcontroller all soldered up. I forgot about these two chips here too. Let's solder those before we get rid of the J tip. I'm not really sure the orientation of this chip, but I think this little line and this little dot on this side means that this is the front side of the chip over here. So we're gonna be putting this one just like this with the line on the left side here. The first thing I'm gonna do is solder this top left pin here. I'm gonna do my best to line up the chip and then heat up that pin and then slowly introduce the chip to it. It's definitely not lined up all the way, so I'm gonna do that again, heat up the pin, and try to get the chip lined up on that pad. That was actually a little bit difficult, so I'm not sure if that was the best way to do this, but I've got it positioned here, and we might try a different strategy on this other chip. With this chip lined up, let's go ahead and solder the opposite end and the opposite side of the chip, kinda of get it tacked in place. Now let's go ahead and do a little drag soldering on the top here. Okay, once we set to the top, let's do the bottom here. All right, that looks pretty good for this chip. Now for this other chip, I'm gonna try a different strategy. Let's put the chip in place before we put any solder down. Okay, with the chip lined up, let's add some flux. Let's try to tack it down first. Okay, now we can flip it around and do the opposite end. Okay, that worked a little bit easier. Let's go ahead and solder the rest of this chip. With these shift registers out of the way, let's go ahead and switch to a chisel tip. Down here in the corner, we're gonna have to solder this little MOSFET. So let's add a little bit of solder to this top left pad. I'm gonna hold the MOSFET with my tweezers, heat up the solder on that pad, and slide the MOSFET into it. With the MOSFET secured, let's go ahead and solder the other two legs. With the MOSFET secured, there's just two more components up here at the top of the board. The easier of the two will be this little button, so let's go ahead and add some solder to the top of pad again. And I'm gonna follow the same process for soldering this button.
The only thing left to do is solder this little voltage regulator, and that's gonna go up here. We probably should have done this earlier, but that's all right. We're gonna go ahead and solder that top left pad again. And we're pretty much gonna do the exact same thing again. Now that we have all the surface mount components soldered, let's go ahead and solder all the through hole components on both the shield and the Spartan FPGA board. The first thing I'm gonna do is solder these pin headers to the six holes in the middle of the shield. So I'm gonna put the small side of the pin headers down into the shield. And then we're gonna turn it over and get some solder on one of the pins. Don't worry about doing a great job right now, we're just trying to hold on to the pin, but make sure that your finger is not on the pin that you're trying to solder. I'm gonna add the second row to mine too, so I can make sure both rows are straight. And if you're happy, go ahead and solder the rest of the pins. One thing I forgot to mention before is that these pin headers are actually gonna stick straight up on the board. The next thing we're gonna do is solder the rows of pin headers on either side of the shield at the top here and at the bottom down here. I'm gonna use the same technique for soldering these headers, although this time these headers are gonna be on the bottom of the shield. All right, all the headers on both sides of the board are soldered. Now the very last thing to do on the shield here is solder this Super Nintendo controller port. It's gonna go in like this, and we're gonna make sure that the flat part of the port down here is sitting flat down on the shield. And we're gonna do the same thing, tack it down with some solder. And if you're happy with the placement down here, then go ahead and solder the rest. If we leave these legs sticking up, they're gonna interfere with the Spartan board, so we have to go ahead and cut these flush. I have a really beat up pair of side cutters that I use for this. I think that should be good enough, but we can check again when we have the shield on the FPGA board. Before we move on to soldering the female headers to the FPGA board, I actually made a mistake on the shield here. When I was first soldering these pin headers, I didn't think the second row was necessary, but if we take a look at the FPGA, you can see that there's a matching second row of pins here. It says right here, FPGA GPIO 109 to 100. That's referring to the second row of pins down here. So we definitely do wanna go back and solder that second row of pins here. Now we have all the male pin headers soldered, let's go ahead and solder the female ones to the FPGA board. We're gonna use pretty much the same method to solder these female headers onto the board. With both the female and the male headers ready, let's go ahead and try to do a test fit. That looks pretty good. The next thing that we have to do is program both the shield and the Spartan FPGA board. There's a really good wiki on the GBA HD shield wiki that shows you how to program the shield, so I'm gonna be following that. We're going to be using a Seedwino Nano to program the shield, so the first thing that we have to do is program the Arduino ISP sketch onto that Nano. So in the Arduino IDE, we're going to go to File, Examples, and we're going to select this Arduino ISP. I'm going to plug in that Seedwino Nano, and then under Tools and Boards, we're going to select Arduino Nano, and then I'm just going to upload this to the Seedwino Nano. I think I need to go to Tools and Port and select this COM6 to select the COM port on the Nano. Now I should be able to click Upload under Sketch. After this Arduino ISP sketch is uploaded, we can disconnect the Nano, and then I'm gonna connect the shield to the Arduino using this diagram. I have the Nano attached to a breadboard, so I can leave a picture of how I'm connecting the shield to the Seedwino for this programming. Next, we need the firmware that we're gonna to flash to the shield, so I'm gonna to go to the GBAHD Shield GitHub and download the repository. Once it's downloaded, I'm gonna go into the FW folder and open FW.ino. I'm gonna plug the Seedwino Nano back in, then I'm gonna to go to Tools and make sure that board is selected as Arduino Pro or Pro Mini, and the processor is at mega 328p, 3.3 volts, 8 megahertz. Then under Sketch, I'm gonna click Upload Using Programmer. I keep forgetting to select this COM port. Now again, I'm gonna go to Upload Using Programmer. After the sketch is done uploading, we're gonna use this program called AVR Dude SS to check the fuses. We're gonna select Atmel AVR ISP from the dropdown, we select this COM6 from the port, and set the baud rate to 19,200. I guess we'll select Detect here, and then we'll hit read. 
And now we need to set the correct fuses. So for this low fuse, we're gonna set that to E2 and high is gonna be D9 like it is already. And E or EXT, we're gonna set that to FF. We'll check the set fuses box and hit right. I guess we can click read again and see what it says. And it seems like it's set up correctly. It seems like that's all there is for programming the shield. Let's try to program the Spartan FPGA board. Again, I'm gonna be using the GBA HD shield wiki to install the firmware on this Spartan FPGA. I've got a brand new SD card and you can go ahead and format it as FAT32, but mine already was. Then I'm gonna download not the GBA HD shield repository, but the normal GBA HD project repository from the Zwenergy GitHub. In the root of the SD card, I'm going to make a new folder called overlay. I'm going to copy the default.bit file from the bitstream folder from the repository and put it in that overlay folder. Now we can take the SD card out and put it in the Spartan board. Next, we're going to set the power mode jumper on the Spartan board to off. And on mine, it came like that. And we're also going to move the rightmost JTAG dip switch up. Now we need to download this library also from Zwenergy so that we can upload FPGA logic to the board. After we download the library in the examples folder under 01 load default bitstream, we're going to open this INO file in the Arduino IDE. We need to add the Spartan board to the Arduino IDE. So under preferences, we're going to add this URL from the wiki under additional board manager URLs. Now under tools and boards, let's go to boards manager and we need to search for ESP32 and install this library. With the library installed, we can go ahead and plug in the Spartan board. Under tools and then board ESP32 Arduino, we're going to select do it ESP32 dev kit v1. Upload speed we're going to set it to 115,200 and we'll leave the other stuff alone. We're going to make sure that COM6 port is selected. We're going to open the serial monitor and we're going to make sure that the baud rate is set to that same number as the upload rate. Now we can go ahead and click upload on the sketch. I got this fatal error here so we're going to go ahead and try something over in sketch. We're going to click include library and then add a zip file. I'm going to add that Spartan Edge ESP32 boot master zip file. Let's try the upload again. None of this says connecting here. We have to hit the white boot button on the FPGA board. I had to hold mine down for a few seconds. I think we're done uploading. It says done uploading here and we have run a bunch in the serial monitor. I'm going to go ahead and unplug the Spartan board, set that rightmost dip switch back down again. And while we're here, we're going to set the power mode jumper to on instead of off. There's one more thing we have to do before we can move on to putting together the GBA HD. There are two little solder pads here that we have to bridge so that we can send 3.3 volts to the shield instead of five volts. I've got this little piece of component leg, so I'm gonna solder that to the two pads on the FPGA board here. I'm gonna add some solder to the right pad here. And I'm gonna tin the component leg. And then solder it to that pad from before. Then I'll add some solder to the opposite pad. And finally, I'll cut the component leg short. So now we have a nice bridge between those two pads. Let's put this aside and grab our Game Boy. Let's take the Game Boy apart using a tri-wing screwdriver. Let's take the battery cover off with just a normal Phillips screwdriver and try to take the battery out. And we're left with another tri-wing screw underneath here. I've never actually taken a Game Boy SP apart before. It looks like there's a couple more screws around here. I think that's all the screws that I can see. Let's try to take this apart. Now I know somewhere in here is a flex cable. We have to be careful about that. Oh, and here it is. So let's detach this flex cable. and remove the flex cable. And now we can remove all these buttons. We need to remove a bunch of components from this board, such as the L and R buttons, the charge port, as well as the volume slider. I'm gonna start with the L and R buttons. With the buttons out of the way, let's go ahead and try to remove this crystal right here. I switched it up for a knife edge tip to see if I can heat up both pads at the same time, but I think I'm gonna actually switch to just trying some solder braid just to get the solder off the pads. Got 
Got to be really careful here because there's these really tiny components that I don't want to lift. This is not going very well, and I even lost one of the components over here. The really tiny components I said to be careful around. Yeah, I lost one of those. I have it, I'll have to solder it on afterwards. But I think I'm gonna try a different tactic here. I read that you should just be able to use a pair of pliers and kind of rip this off. So I'm gonna be very gentle as I rip this thing apart, but let's try to grab it with these pliers and kind of twist it a little bit. Well, I got the top part off. That was really terrible. I had to break mine apart into little pieces and eventually it got off. I do not recommend doing it this way. Honestly, the safest way to do it would be to use a hot air workstation, which I don't have yet. I highly recommend investing in one of those if you're gonna try this mod. It's annoying to have to buy an expensive tool to do this, but that's the safest way to do it. I'm gonna clean up this board and reattach that component that fell off. 12 seconds later. Since I completely lost that component by the crystal here, I want to try to test this thing as soon as possible to see if I actually need to buy a new Game Boy Advance. I posted about this on Twitter and KinoX51, who is actually the creator of the GBA HD Shield wiki, he suggested that I could wire up a couple of these wires from this little quick solder board thing here and get the Game Boy up and running to see if it actually will boot. So that's what I'm going to do. Just keep in mind that I still have to come back and remove this volume switch here as well as the charging port up here. So we're gonna flip the board over and we're actually gonna double-sided tape this quick solder board onto the Game Boy right here. Something like that. I probably should have pre-soldered the pads on this quick solder board, so let's do that right now. I've got this nice thin silicone wire I'm gonna to use to wire up this QSB. The only three wires you need to test the Game Boy are clock one, VCC, and ground. So let's strip and tin a piece of wire, and we'll start with clock one here first. And that's gonna go up to this test pad up here in the corner. So let's tin the test pad and sort of route the wire like this. We'll cut it to length. And we'll tin it. And we'll solder it onto that test point. Next up is VCC right here, and it's gonna go to this test point down here. And last for right now is ground, which is gonna go up here to this bat minus pad right there. Now with those three wires connected, I should be able to hook up these two flat flex cables and hook it up to the shield and plug in the FPGA and I should be able to get video from the Game Boy. So the Game Boy does still work. I was able to plug in USB-C here and this mini HDMI and when I plugged the USB in, the Game Boy turned on and I got video out of the HDMI. But it's a good sign that the Game Boy still works so I'm gonna disassemble everything here and take you through the rest of the steps for assembling this GBA HD. I'd like to make one quick note before we move on. I had to solder this jumper right here. This jumper enables the shield here to deliver four volts to the Game Boy Advance. You'll have to solder this too in order for the shield to power on the Game Boy. So if your Game Boy Advance is not powering on after you put this kit together, it's because you forgot this jumper. Okay, now we're back to removing components from the Game Boy Advance. I still have to remove this charging port here as well as the volume slider. So let's focus on the port first. I'm gonna flip it over. And I'm gonna use my solder sucker to remove the solder from these two joints up here. First I'll add some fresh solder. And I'm gonna use my good solder sucker. And I'll remove any remaining solder in there with some wick. All right, I'll turn the board over again. And I'm gonna add some flux here. I'm gonna hold on to the port with some tweezers and I'm gonna try to heat these pins up here.
That doesn't seem to be working. I'm gonna try to use my solder braid to get the solder off of these pins. That was pretty janky, but I managed to do it. I lost a pad there, but I think we should be okay. Removing some of these components is actually optional for making the GBA HD actually work. Like the charging port here and the slider don't actually have to be removed, but they need to be removed if they're gonna fit into the 3D printed case. Now we've got to remove this volume slider, which again, I think I'm gonna have a hard time with. Let's try removing the solder from these legs here. Okay, now let's do the other. And finally, we're gonna lift these top legs back here. Again, I lifted some more pads, but I think that's okay. And in order to enable analog output through a headphone jack, we're gonna have to solder a wire from a test point right here to one of these vias on the buttons that we just soldered earlier. So let's solder the test point and the via, and we'll solder a wire between them. Also, the Shield Wiki recommends to install one of these GBA SP power cleaners. So I bought one and I'm gonna install it on the back side of the SP here. It's just gonna go right in here. And it solders in a few different places, one here by the power switch, and then around two of these capacitors here in the middle of the board. So let's start with those capacitors, add some flux, and then we're gonna gently try to solder one half of this capacitor. We may have to hold it down with some tweezers. And then I'm just gonna solder the other sides of the capacitors. With the capacitors all set, let's go ahead and solder the other part to the switch here. The only thing left to do is solder the rest of the wires on the QSB here. I'll put a diagram up on the screen that shows each of these pads and where they go on the board, but I'm gonna go through them on my board off screen. And here's a close up of what all my wiring looks like after I wired up the QSB. With the wiring for the Game Boy all set, the only thing left for us to do is get everything prepared to fit in the case. We're gonna need to attach some wires to the buttons and the headphone jack, so let's go ahead and do that. The power button has two sets of wires, one for the actual button and the other one for the LEDs. So we're gonna need to attach two sets of wires to this button. I'm gonna use some normal ribbon wire for this and I'm just gonna grab two sets of two wires each. Let's add some solder to each leg of the button. And we'll strip and tin our black and white wire and solder the wires to the negative and positive legs on the button. Now we'll do the same thing for the other two legs that are gonna be used for the button. All right, that's the power switch all wired up. Now I'm gonna do the same thing for the reset switch. Okay, now the reset button's all set. The last thing we have to do is the audio jack. This one only has three legs and it can be one group of three. So let's go ahead and wire that up. And with the audio jack all wired up, let's go ahead and put all three of those things into the case. Since I have the audio jack, let's go ahead and put that in this hole right here. All right, next let's put the reset button in here. And finally, let's do the power button in the front. All 
All right, I think that looks pretty good. With both buttons and the audio jack installed, let's go ahead and flip the case over. Now on Joe the Ripper's Thingiverse page for the case, he actually shows the slider switch on the FPGA is actually desoldered. Otherwise, this is not gonna be able to fit in the case. So let's go ahead and desolder this slider now. With that switch removed, now we can go ahead and put the FPGA board and the shield into the bottom of the case. So we can slide the Super Nintendo controller port part on this side. And now we can push down the FPGA board until the ports stick through these ports here. Okay, now we can flip it back over again. And let's very carefully put the FFC cables in. So we're gonna need this small one here. It's gonna go in here. And then close the locking tab. And now we're gonna put this bigger FFC in the middle connector right here. We're only gonna use two of the four FFCs for the Game Boy Advance SP. Now let's grab the Game Boy and we're gonna to need to solder the wires for the buttons and the audio jack to the Game Boy Advance. Let's start with the audio jack. If you look carefully at the headphone jack, there's one leg that's in the middle there, that's for ground, and there's a left leg and a right leg. If you have it in this orientation where the ground is at the top, this left pin is the left channel and the right pin is the right channel. Over on the Game Boy, you can see there's a test point right here, this is A ground and then you could see R out and actually it's labeled over here it says left out that's actually this test pad up here so let's go ahead and tin up all three of those test pads let's go ahead and cut our wire to length I'm gonna cut it to be about six or eight inches I don't think we need a ton of length and I'm gonna separate and tin all of these wires now I'll solder the left and right wires on and finally we can solder the ground wire to the ground test pad With the audio jack wired up, let's go ahead and wire up the reset button. My reset button has both the reset wires as well as the power for the LED here. So we're just gonna ignore the LED power for now and we're gonna look at the wiring for the actual switch itself. Now the actual pads for the reset are this test point right here and this big piece of ground right there for the ground. So just solder one wire of the reset button to the reset test pad and the other one to this ground point right there. So again, we're gonna cut our length of wire and separate the wires and tin them. Let's tin that reset test point as well as that piece of ground plane. And we'll solder one wire to that ground plane and the other wire to that test point. It doesn't matter which wire goes to which, all it has to do is bridge that connection. I think we can go ahead and stuff the rest of these wires through the case so that they come out on the other side. And before we put the Game Boy Advance in the case, we can attach these flat flex cables to the Game Boy Advance screen connector here, as well as the QSB. Let's do the smaller cable first. It's gonna be blue side up into the QSB here. And with the cable in all the way, you can enclose the connector. And now this other FFC is actually going to be blue side down. So this ribbon is gonna be with the blue side facing the Game Boy. and again, close the connectors. And with both FFCs connected, let's go ahead and try to get the Game Boy in the case. Remember that the extension port is gonna to have to go into the case first to go into this hole. This is kind of ridiculous. How are you supposed to fit all these cables in here? I guess maybe if this wire was on the other side of this cable, Okay, now let's try to get this in there again. Okay, I think I kind of just ended up jamming all the cables in there like this, get that extension port in the hole here, and then just kind of shove it all in there. Something like that. 
While we're here, we want to make sure that the power switch is set to off on the Game Boy. So mine is slid all the way to the left there, and that's where we want it. Now you can flip this over and finish the wiring on the bottom here. Somewhere along the line, I lost the footage to soldering these wires on the bottom of the GBA HD, but the wiring is pretty simple. These two wires that come from the power switch go to these bottom left two points that were on the power switch of the Spartan board. It doesn't matter which one goes where, all they have to do is bridge the connection in order to turn it on. Now for the LED wiring, since I have LEDs in both my power switch and the reset switch, I put both of the negative sides of those LEDs to the ground pin or this left pin here, and the positive side of those LEDs goes to the 3.3 volt pin, which is here. With all the wiring out of the way, let's go ahead and finish putting together our case. First, we wanna make sure that the SD card is not in the Spartan board. We're gonna take the bottom piece of the case here and make sure that the SD card slot part that's here goes over the SD card over here. Mine is kind of a tough fit, so I have to sort of bend it in certain places. And don't forget to put the SD card back in. Then we're gonna flip it over and we're gonna add this cartridge slot protector thing in the front here. The little lip is going to be face down and it fits just like that, right in the front. And last but not least, the top of the case. All right, with our GBA HD assembled, let's go ahead and test it out. Now that we're inside a game, let's go ahead and talk about the different button combinations. In order to bring up the GBA HD menu, go ahead and hold L, R, select, and up, which brings up an OSD that shows the current firmware version as well as the settings that we can change. As of this version, we only have two settings. One is a pixel grid, which is supposed to be like a CRT filter that comes in either dark color or a brighter color. And the other option is a smoothing filter, which will try to blend together the sharp pixels. There's a 2X and a 4X mode. Currently, there's no color adjustment like there is in the GBA consoleizer. The default colors on the Game Boy Advance are really bright when you show them on a monitor. I guess that's not really a fault of the GBA HD. It's just a nice added feature of the Game Boy Advance consoleizer. The other button combination is the IGR or in-game reset. If you go ahead and hold left, right, select, and start, the GBA HD will reset, which is good if you're like me and you have an EverDrive. That way you don't have to reach over and hit the reset button on the GBA HD to select a different game. With the general features out of the way, let's go ahead and do a side-by-side -side comparison between the GBA HD and the Game Boy Advance consoleizer. When you look at the GBA HD and the consoleizer side by side, the GBA HD looks a little bit darker. I don't think the colors look bad on the GBA HD and you would never be able to tell the difference unless you had both a consoleizer and a GBA HD and looked at them side by side. I believe the consoleizer does some sort of a gamma correction where it actually boosts the brightness of the colors. So that could be the big difference between those two. So the real differences between the GBA HD and the consoleizer are in the features. There are a few more features in the consoleizer such as the color filter that you can add that makes, in my opinion, the colors look better and there are more scanline options with the consoleizer but i really don't use any of those features in the consoleizer and to me the gba hd is a little bit more stable especially when you compare it against the consoleizer using that dbi plus mode which the consoleizer uses to add audio to the hdmi but i find when i use that dbi plus mode the consoleizer doesn't always work right but that doesn't mean that the GBA HD is entirely stable either. There are times when I'll start the GBA HD and I'll just have no audio or video at all. I think the bottom line is there are a lot of points of failure with the GBA HD, some of which are caused by the very compact case, which might add some pressure to the flex cables or pressure to the wiring or even pressure to the pin headers between the shield and the FPGA. Also, the mini HDMI port is not flush with the outside of the case. So I think in some cases, the mini HDMI cable does not fit all the way into the socket, making a really good connection. This is such a problem that my GBA HD actually lives outside of its case. I'm kind of afraid to put it all together because I'll get it all assembled and then either
either the audio and video won't work and it's just a mess and I have to take it all apart and see what's wrong. And I do want to mention that the experimental 1080p firmware had some weird audio crackling issues, so I really didn't find that firmware very usable. It's unfortunate that besides retro upgrades, no one is really making this shield. I think that would make this project a lot more popular if people could just buy the shield and then worry about the rest of the assembly instead of having to hand solder the shield. With that being said, there is a lot to like about the GBA HD project. It's open source, so that means that there could be a lot of functionality added to the firmware in the future. And while the case does have its issues, I think it's actually a really clever design. It's friction fit, which means that you don't need any screws to attach either the Game Boy Advance board or the FPGA into the case. And it looks really awesome on a desk. Give this video a like if it helped you understand what this GBA HD project is all about, and get subscribed so you don't miss any of my console modding tutorials. I'll see you in the next video.